Lecture 1, Catholic View and Non-Catholic Views of History. <coughs> In this introductory lecture, we will see how the Stoic, the Enlightenment, and the postmodern understanding of history profoundly differs from a Catholic understanding. We will also see how ancient myths from around the world encourage a historical view that is markedly different from a Catholic one. Finally, the uniquely Catholic view of history, especially of church history, will be presented. The Stoic view of history. Is history a cycle? Stoicism was a popular Greek philosophical school active before, at, and during the time of the early church. In accordance with their deterministic view of the cosmos, the Stoics thought history is cyclical. A historical cycle, explained the Stoics, begins out of a fiery chaos, develops in an intelligibly discernible manner until it finally once again returns to its fiery state to begin a new cycle. The German modern historian Oswald Spengler similarly held that the pattern of history resembles a, a, a circle. In explaining his view, Spengler likens history to a biological organism, like an amoeba whose growth, decline, and death follows a predetermined set of biological laws. The Enlightenment View of History As we will eventually study, the age of the Enlightenment, roughly from 1600s to the early 1800s, coincided with the so-called scientific revolution. Some Enlightenment philosophers and scientists had a tendency not to see history as cyclical, but rather as one of continual progress. According to this almost naive approach to history, the world is getting better and better as man invents few forms of technology, understands laws of the world, and develops his mind. If the German political philosopher Karl Marx is considered as part of the tail end of the Enlightenment movement, in him we see an Enlightenment philosopher proposing that human history will eventually end in a near-perfect civilization where the state withers away, is replaced by advances in technology, and is absent from class conflict. The Postmodern View of History When attempting to explain phases in history, which often occur as a reaction to preceding phases, Historians ordinarily describe a Romantic era, which exalted the emotions, as coming after the age of the Enlightenment. The Romantic era was in turn replaced by the modern era, which once again the mind's ability to grasp and understand inherent laws within the universe was stressed over myths, stories, and feelings. Once again, though, this era was replaced by the current times we live, called the postmodern era. According to postmodern thought, at least as represented by Jean-Francois Lyotard in his book The Postmodern Condition, the world is ir irrational with no overarching explanatory stories or myths or meta-narratives. He asserts this, Simplifying to the extreme, I define postmodern as incredulity towards meta-narratives. This incredulity is undoubtedly a product of progress in the sciences, but that progress in turn presupposes it. To the obsolescence of the meta-narrative apparatus of legitimation corresponds, most notably, the crisis of metaphysical philosophy and that of the university institution which in part relied on it. The narrative function is losing its functors, its great heroes, its great dangers, its great voyages, its great goal. It's being dispersed in clouds of narrative language elements, narrative, but also denotive, prescriptive, descriptive, and so on conveyed within each cloud are pragmatic valencies specific to its kind. Each of us lives at the intersection of many of these. However, we do not necessarily establish stable language combinations, and the properties of the ones we do establish are not necessarily communicable." End of quote. Ancient Myths and History The deconstruction encouraged by postmodern thinkers is not a brand new approach to understanding the world, the postmodern belief that our rationality and sense of logic is not fundamental but only springs forth from an attempt to order the irrational, chaotic universe resonates with virtually all ancient myths. According to these myths, the world was not created by a reasonable god, but rather was formed out of a primordial chaos. From disorder came forth gods who then created men, women, and the world as we know it. According to a Catholic interpretation of Genesis, in light of the first chapter of John's Gospel, God the Father created the world through His Word, 
his Son, in the love of the Holy Spirit. What is most fundamental to the universe, consequently, is not chaos, not irrationality, but rather reason, as Christ the Word, informed by love, so not a static reason, but reason informed by love, the Holy Spirit, in eternal relationship with the Father. Even though creation contains differences, which at times can seem to be fundamentally in disorder as they clash about, this aspect is not what gives ultimate definition to the universe. Rather, they are to be understood in light of Trinitarian difference, which preceded and upholds created difference. In Trinitarian difference, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not constantly smashing and clashing into one another because they are different, but rather through their differences the greatest unity possible exists. This means that creation, in its deepest sense, bears the imprint of an orderly, peaceful, harmonious, triune creator. As noted by the theologian Bishop Robert Baring, who convincingly and rightly argues the most basic pulse, beat, the heartbeat of the universe, is one of peace, order, and harmony, not one of violence, chaos, and disorder. And I'd like to read a short quotation from the bishop, and he states this. It is certainly clear that, from, the very, early, from very early in the theological tradition, Christian thinkers speak of God's creation as taking place ex nihilo, from nothing. And we find this teaching confirmed in all of the great theologians. Jesus, in speaking peace to those who had betrayed and killed him, opened up a new conception of God, one who brings order not through violence but through compassion. Accordingly, when Christians begin to reflect on the nature of creation, they speculated that this true God of Jesus Christ brings the world into being, not through an orgy of violence as in so many of the ancient myths, but precisely through a sheer, sheerly non-violent act of generous love. To make the universe ex nihilo is to bring forth without competition, without antagonism or violence, fighting nothing, resting nothing into shape, pressing nothing to the ground. And more to the point, as Thomas Aquinas and others point out, this non-violent act of God is not a once and for all event the beginning of time. Rather, it is the ongoing continual act by which the world at every moment is sustained in existence. Hence, divine nonviolence is the actualizing, actualizing and unifying energy of all creation. And therefore, when we walk in the path of nonviolence, we are claiming and unleashing a truth force, participating in an energy that runs through the cosmos in all its dimensions. This is why, of course, nonviolence, when effectively practiced, is remarkably powerful. In the century just concluded, the bloodiest on record, Nonviolent methods liberated the subcontinent of India, affected a mass social change in the United States, and most stunningly brought down a communist empire defended by an enormous military establishment. Paul said that the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus crucified and risen from the dead is dynamis, power, to a cosmos in need of transformation, and this gospel is nothing but the good news of God's nonviolent love. When we Christians announce it and more to the point live it, we tap into this divine power, we tap into this divine dynamis, which overmatches any of the powers of the world. End of quote. Once peace and harmony is seen more and more as the fundamental building blocks of the universe, then we will be more likely to found our civilizations, above all civilizations fostered by Christian belief and practice, upon a foundation of peace and not upon the sand of violence. If, though, people assume that what is most basic to the universe is chaotic violence, then civilizations and the history of civilizations will be understood as merely a reflection of the destructive chaos from which it emerged. Incidences of love, peace, harmony, and order that one may find in history, especially as evident in the lives of the saints, are then dismissed as merely incidental, accidental to a universe that is ultimately ruled by chance and violence. As is evident in your transcript, some of the most ancient civilizations thought precisely in this manner, for they assume that violence is what is most basic to the universe, and this is evident in their mythology. And in your transcript, I provide you excerpts from Japanese creation myth, where what is the beginning of, of the world is stated as 
coming out of chaos. Norse creation myths hold the same thing. Greek creation myths also states, right, it says, in the beginning there was only chaos. Then out of the void appeared Erebus, the noble place where, dwell, where death dwells, and night, all else was silent, etc. Babylonian creation myths, same. A Catholic understanding of history. A Catholic conception of history can be represented by a spiral, which includes both a linear and cyclical dimension. The rise and fall of the spiral represents both sinful patterns in history and natural cycles such as seasonal changes from spring, summer, fall, and winter. The linear movement of the spiral is ultimately due to Christ being the Alpha and Omega of history, the beginning and end of history. In addition, Christ's birth and time is cyclically repeated and tapped into by means of the celebration of the Eucharist as we spiral to the end of time as we know and experience time. In the beginning of time, God the Father created the world through His Son. At the end of time, as we experience it now, God the Father will send His Son to judge the living and the dead. This means that history has a beginning from Christ and a direction towards Christ. The human experience of history is not, therefore, like what a hamster experiences or a gerbil experiences when it is exercising in his miniature treadmill. Even though the hamster might feel it is going from one point to another, he actually is only going in circles. Despite the world's natural cycles and cycles due to, to sin, the history of man has a specific direction to it, through Christ, by God the Father. In addition, saints, borrowing terminology from the British historian Arnold Toynbee, can be seen as creative minorities who alter the course of history by their holy lives. We are not, according to the Catholic faith, at the mercy of cycles in history, but can, when we cooperate with grace, change the course of history. Can you think of anyone who exemplifies this currently? The Church officially canonizes these saints in order to set before us examples of holy men and women who use their God-given freedom to build up the kingdom of God in our present, here and not yet experience of heavenly realities. In order to understand Church history properly, as distinct from other histories, it is necessary to remember the saints who give Church history its specific Christian contours. Although the quote that I will read shortly from the then Cardinal Ratzinger was written in relationship to theologians, I think the term theologian can be replaced by the term historian and still be valid. For historians to rightly understand and present the uniqueness of Catholic Church history, the role of the saints must not be overlooked. So let me read that, and in reading his quote, I'm substituting uh, history for historian for a theologian. So the work of the historian is secondary with regard to the real experience of the saints. Without this reference point, without the deep anchoring in such an experience, his work becomes detached from reality. This is the humility demanded from reality. This is humility demanded for the historian. Without the realism of the saints, without their contact with the, with the reality of which theology speaks, it degenerates into an empty intellectual game and also loses its scientific character. We will conclude this lecture by viewing church history in one final way, as a circular pool of water into which Christ dives gracefully into its center, representing the fullness of time. The waves caused by this perfect dive affects all of history, present, past, and future. The shores of the pool represent eternity and in a certain sense our heavenly destination. The various circles represent different stages of Christian history, just as Christ, and then the next circle, Peter as Christ's vicar, the twelve apostles, seventy-two disciples, the crowds, etc. God bless.